Hi, welcome to Road to Vostok Devlog episode 1. My name is Antti, I'm a Finnish game developer and a former army officer who decided to resign in order to make video games. This devlog is a behind the scenes documentary series about the survival game that I've been working on called Road to Vostok. Road to Vostok is a hardcore single-player survival game set in a post-apocalyptic border zone between Finland and Russia. With this devlog series, I will be showcasing the current progress and the features of the game. I would also like to share some game development tips and tricks that I have learned through these years of making video games. In this introduction episode, I'm going to cover six different topics. Background, game design, core mechanics, visual style, development tools, and finally, a roadmap for the game. About 10 years ago, I found this game called Armature Daisy mod. I was instantly hooked to the post-apocalyptic survival game genre and decided that I want to learn how to make video games. I downloaded Unity Game Engine and tried game development for the first time. I had absolutely zero knowledge and quickly found out that making video games is actually really hard and way more complicated than I originally thought. So I took a little detour from this dream of becoming a game developer. I joined the military through Finland's conscript service. I eventually became a platoon leader and even applied to Finnish National Defense University. I graduated from there and ended up serving as an army lieutenant. After being in the military for almost five years, I made a risky move and decided to resign in order to pursue a career in the game industry, which indeed was my true passion. I started by learning the basic principles of game design and then taught myself a wide range of game development skills like 3D modeling, shader development, CSAR programming and pretty much everything there is to learn about this Unity game engine. After that I did tons of small solo game projects, became a freelancer by selling 3D game assets and also started working as a visual game design teacher in a private school. I have been teaching game development for nearly four years now. I have taught over 100 game dev students and mentored over 200 student game projects. But even though there are a lot of positives of being a teacher, my true goal was still to become a full-time solo game developer. So I took the next logical step and started working on this ambitious survival game idea in order to achieve that goal. I had basically all the skills needed in order to make this large-scale survival game. But first I wanted to make sure that I had a solid game idea so I decided to go through this one year pre-production phase. During this pre-production phase, I remembered and wrote notes from my personal military experiences. I revisited and studied some of my favorite survival and FPS games. I developed different prototypes and tried different visual styles. And finally I designed workflows and tools that would speed up the upcoming main production phase. After this year of pre-production, I had a clear vision and a solid foundation to build upon. And this ends my background and the story of how and why I started making this game. Road to Vostok is a hardcore survival game, which main idea is based on this dangerous and mysterious zone called Vostok. This idea of a dangerous zone is commonly used in video games and I will try to explain some of my game design elements with three zone-related examples. The first one is the Stalker franchise. In Stalker you explore this alternative Chernobyl exclusion zone where the zone is filled with dangers like mutants, anomalies and hostile factions. Typically the game's primary goal is to reach to the center of the zone. But that's not required in order to have fun in the game. The real fun, in my opinion, is the zone itself. Inside the zone, there are so many atmospheric environments, mysteries and characters, and narrative opportunities, you often actually forgot that you are in this mission to reach to the center of the zone. I really like this idea that you basically have an initial goal, but it's not the main point of the game. The game world itself should be the main selling point and the sandbox for storytelling. The second example is RuneScape and its wasteland zone called the Wilderness. The Wilderness is a north region part of the game world. It's a PvP focused high risk high reward zone and easily one of the most dangerous places in the game. 
The wilderness contains hostile players and monsters and is also separated from the safer areas by a wall or a ditch. The key element of this zone is the risk, because if you die in the wilderness, whether it's from a player or a monster, you will lose all or most of your items and stuff you were carrying. In this example, compared to the starker one, the most compelling design element for me is the high risk, high reward ideology. In terms of map design, I also like the clear separation of the dangers and the safe zones. The dangerous zone is bordered and it acts like a forbidden fruit. It's compelling and if you enter the zone, you know the penalty you may suffer if you die. The third example is from DAISY. In DAISY there is this area known as NWAF, which stands for Northwest Airfield. Located in the northwest corner of the map, this high tier loot area contains the largest military base and airfield in DAISY. And it's also probably the most dangerous place in the game, thanks to hostile players called bandits. This dangerous airfield area is a natural player progression goal and basically acts like a funnel because new players are typically spawned on the southeast shoreline on the map and after some initial looting they are headed inland towards these high tier loot areas. I remember when playing the original Armour 2 Daisy mod. I had always this preparation phase where I would loot, plan and prepare before heading into this dangerous airfield. Back then the journey to this airfield area was one of the main thrill of the game and design-wise I really like this prepare for the dangerous journey idea. These three examples are the main inspiration for Road to Vostok. And here's my plan how I'm going to implement these design elements to my game idea. The game world will be divided into three main zones. These are called Area 5, Border Zone and Vostok. Area 5 is a relatively low risk starting zone, Border Zone is basically a transition zone and Vostok is that dangerous and mysterious high risk zone which is mostly designed for endgame content and main goal for the player. The playable game world itself is made from individual maps which are unique areas within the current zone and based on real world locations. These maps are connected to each other and you can transition between maps by using transition points found inside each map. Transition points are mostly things like roads, paths, passages or tunnels and they will be always available to the player. Each map will also have a difficulty rating in terms of NPC AI and the idea is that when you travel east and towards Vostok, the game will get harder but the loot will get better. However, between Area 05 and Vostok, there is this guarded border zone and a physical border. This border can only be crossed by using so-called crossing points. Each of these crossing points will have a unique game mechanic and a certain level of risk associated with them. For example, some crossing points are quite abandoned and require just basic map knowledge or tools, while other crossing points are always fully guarded and require good combat or stealth skills from the player. But before heading into any of these crossing points, you would most likely want to do some initial looting and preparing for this dangerous journey to Vostok. For this purpose, the Area of 5 will have shelters, which are basically safe areas and places to store loot but they are all different in terms of size and customizability. For example, some shelter may be a spacious and cozy cabin, while other might be claustrophobic and dirty drain pipe. Then we get into some of the hardcore elements of the game. These shelters are basically like isolated checkpoints, and they are the only way to save your game. If you die in Area 5, outside of the shelter, you will lose your gear and your inventory items, but everything that is stored in these shelters is still saved. In Vostok, however, you will only have one shelter, and this shelter is quite different from those in Area 05. This shelter is meant to be hidden, and the location is randomized in each game, so it's also unique to every player. The shelter can be used for storing loot and saving your game, just like in Area 05, but this shelter isn't customizable, and it's quite opposite from being a safe area. Also, the moment you cross the border by using a crossing point and enter Vostok, you are inside the permadeath zone. If you die in Vostok, you will lose absolutely everything, including your shelter items and save files. And like mentioned before, this whole concept is going to be based on real world locations, and this specific border zone area can be found in southeastern Finland. I have lived near this area for most of my life, and this border zone is pretty much perfect setting for a post-apocalyptic survival game. This area is filled with military history. There is bunkers, anti-tank obstacles, trenches and fortifications pretty much all over the place. 
if you want to learn more about this area, by searching the term Salpaline, you can find pretty interesting content and military history of this place. Core mechanics are systems in the game, which are a key part of the main game loop. These mechanics are all important to the game, but in my opinion, it's wise to have some level of priority in terms of development time and resources. In Road to Vostok I have basically two priority levels, Prior 1 and Prior 2. Prior 1 mechanics should be best in class systems with high amount of testing and development time associated with them. When compared against other similar games in the genre, this Prior 1 mechanics should stand out and be appealing to the player. Prior 2 mechanics in other hand are also important and have to be included in the game, but they are not required for having fun in the game. The main idea is that the game should be fun to play with just Prior 1 mechanics and Prior 2 mechanics are just additional layers on top of that core game loop. In this devlog episode, I will only showcase the current progress of the Prior 1 mechanics. Even though these mechanics are far from being production ready, this following clip should demonstrate the gameplay direction that this game is going to have.
these prior one examples were still pretty basic mechanics. Much more will be added to them, but the gameplay feeling is already enjoyable, which is definitely a good sign. I will be showcasing more of these features and prior two mechanics as well in upcoming devlog episodes. Road to Vostok is a game where atmosphere and immersion has an extremely high priority in terms of game art and visual style. Unfortunately, making these immersive game worlds with realistic visual style is my opinion one of the most time-consuming aspects of game development. There are so many time sinks related to game art that in order to manage a large-scale solo game project like this in a reasonable time frame, there has to be clearly defined goals, rules and tools for the game art. My goal is to create believable and atmospheric post-apocalyptic environments that are based in real-world locations. Every location should feel authentic and there should be this abandoned and post-apocalyptic feeling. My rules are that every location must be visited and photographed by myself in order to achieve high visual quality and large collection of reference images, which speeds up the other aspects of development like modeling, texturing and level design. I won't be trying to achieve photorealism or physically based rendering and instead of going fully open world I'm choosing to build location based individual maps. My tools will be heavily focused on procedural generation in terms of asset placement and I will use procedural animations as well in order to avoid manual keyframe animations. I will also be using modular and shader based approaches to other time consuming aspects of game art whenever it's possible. Now let's talk about the visual style and workflows that are specifically tailored for these goals, rules and tools. Here is two examples. This first example is a workflow demonstration about creating these atmospheric and immersive environments that are based in real world locations. It all starts with a main reference. This main reference image is obtained by traveling into these abandoned places and the purpose of this image is to showcase the main feel and general visual style of the location. The next step is so-called photo textures. These photos are taken during the location visit and the idea is to use these photos for autographic texture projection, which is basically an old-fashioned way of texturing, but this technique works for me. All of these photos are taken just with a smartphone, no fancy equipment is needed. Then when I return from visiting that location, I open up Unity and start building the location in Game Engine. First, I generate the base terrain through heightmap based approach and apply some cloudy skybox and linear fog to give some depth to the scene. Then I will use my custom terrain shader which automatically blends different ground textures by using noise patterns, height or angle based settings or vertex colors. After that I make a block out version of the location. A block out is basically just a level design phase where you use primitive models in order to get the dimensions right. Then I will use procedural generation for most of the nature assets. These assets are placed automatically and the generation system is fully connected to this custom terrain shader. I might place some assets manually if needed, 
but still most of the job is done by procedural generation. I also generate small details like sticks, rocks and foliage and after that I switch the block out primitives to game ready assets by using those photo textures mentioned earlier. Then I apply a simple directional light and fine tune some terrain shader properties to match the main reference image. The last step is post processing and color grading. This phase can sometimes be quite time consuming, but I developed myself a predefined color lookup table also known as LUT, so this phase is mostly automated for me. And here's the final comparison between the original real world main reference and the playable game world environment. This specific game environment was done within a one day time period, but of course if there's more complexity in the scene, like buildings, the process would take longer. This second example is more in-depth visual workflow of creating optimized individual models and textures while trying to maintain a high visual quality and in-game resolution. The process starts similar way like the previous example. There's the main reference and photo textures that are taken just with the smartphone. Then I make the 3D model in Blender, but I don't ever use hyperly modeling or baking, just simple primitive modeling and the result should be a clean low poly mesh. After the modeling, I unwrap the mesh with a grid-based approach and I use a method called UV overlapping. I place similar UV islands on top of each other and use some clever mirror and rotation tricks to avoid repeating patterns in the texture. Then I apply those photo textures to the UV layout and I use grid-based snapping tools for fast and precise method for placing the photos. The final step is just dilation to avoid mipmap related color bleeding. And here's the final result. Most of the visual assets that I create is done with a similar workflow. Simple modeling, simple texturing and nothing fancy in order to avoid those additional development steps. Most modern games nowadays try to achieve realistic visual style through this rendering technique called PBR. PBR stands for physically based rendering which basically tries to simulate realistic lighting by giving multiple texture maps to the lit shader. While these PBR maps are essential for modern day graphics, they are not the holy grail of making realistic games. If your game doesn't need them, don't use them. I'm going with the old fashioned way of texturing by using just a base color map which is a compromise. I'm willing to lose some visual lighting quality if this sacrifice gives me development speed and performance budget for other important things. These other important things for me are things like in-game texture resolution and game performance. And this is directly linked to this decision to go with the non-BBR workflow. For example, these other PBR maps aren't free in terms of rendering, they use memory space and if they're not used, this memory space can be directed to somewhere else like pumping up the base map resolution. I have always valued this thing called texture density. By using high resolution textures and the UV overlapping method mentioned earlier, I can achieve very high texture density, which means there's more texture pixels per game world unit. In terms of performance, the single texture ideology also allows me to use optimized GPU friendly shaders and single texture material setups, which are simple and extremely easy to configure. Development tools are tools which are designed to make game development process more efficient, convenient or just more enjoyable. These tools are mostly editor-based tools and helpers. They are not visible to the player but are extremely important to the developer. My thought process around development tools has always been that if you design a game, you should also design stuff for yourself, not just for the player. The idea of spending 10 hours now for designing something that saves 1000 hours later has always sounded pretty compelling for me. It's important to remember that these third party game engines are designed to be as universal as possible and they are not designed for your game idea specifically. Customizing a game engine and making these development tools is indeed time consuming but can sometimes be a deciding factor if the game is ever going to be finished or not. Here's a little video montage of tools that I have made specifically for this project.
Road to Vostok is a long-term project for a single developer, and it's going to take time. But I'm fully committed to make this game one of the best hardcore survival games out there, and I think I have the right background, experience and the skill set for this goal. And here's the main phases for making this game a high quality commercial product. The first phase is a free public demo. This demo is going to be released in this year at the end of summer, probably somewhere near September, and the purpose of this demo is to get initial feedback from those core mechanics and showcase the general visual style of the game. This demo will include a finalized version of one of those Area 5 maps, and there will be also one shelter available to the player. The next phase will be an updated and more feature-rich version of that first demo. This second public demo is also going to be totally free, and it's going to be released around one year after that first demo. This demo is going to be so-called Vertical Slice. It's basically a finalized part of the game content, and it should provide the insight for what it would feel like when playing the finalized version of the game. This demo is going to be more about playtesting the actual game loop, which for my game idea is going to be survival, loot progression and preparing for that dangerous journey to Vostok. This second demo will include three finalized versions of Area 5 maps, two Area 5 shelters, two crossing points and one of those permanent Vostok maps. The next big milestone after those demos will be releasing the game commercially through Steam Early Access. I don't have specific date or timeline for this phase, but in terms of content, it will be then when I have finished 5 Area 5 maps, 3 Area 5 shelters, 4 crossing points and 3 Vostok maps. So basically double the content of that second vertical slice demo. And then somewhere in the future is the full release of the game. 10 Area 5 maps, 10 Area 5 shelters, 10 crossing points, 10 Vostok maps and that one unique Vostok shelter. And that's the current plan of releasing this game. If you want to learn more about my plans and the game in general, I have a website available roadtovostok.com. There's not much content yet, but it's going to be the main hub for details about the development. This was the introduction devlog episode for Road to Vostok. I have many other episodes coming, they will be a bit shorter and more theme focused on some aspect of the game, but the format will be quite similar. It would be awesome to hear your thoughts about this game idea, and also because this was the first devlog episode, if there's any feedback of how I could improve the upcoming episodes, I would like to hear those as well. Thank you for watching and see you in the next episode.